Intermittent fasting is linked with a 91% higher risk of cardiovascular-related death, the headlines read. Not so fast. In today's show, we're going to break down some minor details from this poster session that was presented recently at the American Heart Association's annual conference in Chicago. So as we've talked about on the live on Tuesday afternoon, the headlines that have been overly sensationalized by the mainstream media convincing you that you probably should not intermittent fast or practice time-restricted eating because if you do so, it will increase your risk of heart disease. But I came across some very interesting findings from this abstract that I would like to share with you right now. So as you can see here, this is the abstract. This was conducted by scientists in China along with some researchers at our friendly university, Harvard University, that is notorious for putting out epidemiological studies without giving the media personnel that report on these details, statistical details and baseline characteristics that are very pertinent to understanding the clinical significance of the studies. Let me explain. For starters, the title of this abstract, and this was actually a poster session again at the AHA annual conference, is Association of Eight-Hour Time-Restricted Eating with All-Cause and Cause-Specific Mortality. Again, the headlines are very sensational. They lead people to think that if they are to intermittent fast, they will increase their risk of dying from a cardiovascular-related complication by 91%, which sounds shocking, quite scary. But again, as we talked about on the live session, this data was collected as part of the NHANES data set that has a lot of shortcomings. This involves 24-hour food frequency questionnaires. Investigators will email or call people and say, you know, hey, Bill, did you have a hot dog yesterday or did you have ground beef? You know, what was your protein sources? Hey, Bill, did you eat between the hours of 8 and 10 or 6 and 4 p.m., right? So let's talk about something that is really actually important. And these are the baseline characteristics of the study participants. This is really important when it comes to nutritional epidemiology because there's no intervention here. People are given one or two surveys, in this case, during the first year of the NHANES study period, when people were enrolled into this study, they were just given two dietary recalls. And then they were tracked over time to see what happened to them in terms of a long-term health perspective. Did they have heart disease at the onset of the study? Did they have cancer at the onset of the study? How many years did they live and what was their cause of death? Was it related to heart disease? All, did they die from all causes or cardiovascular specific mortality? And here's what's important to understand. The group that is supposedly the at-risk group here is the folks that ate within a time-restricted feeding window. But lest I remind you, between 2003 and 2018, time-restricted feeding was not a mainstream dietary modality or strategy. Most people didn't even know what, what TRF or TRE meant until 2018, 2019, 2020, right? This was only a few an ultra small minority of health conscious people were actually intentionally practicing time restricted eating. And that's why you can see in the data set here in the baseline characteristics, there was only 414 out of 20,000 people that ate within all of their calories within an eight hour period, which I think is a little bit curious because when you go and look at the number of people that reported, at least per these two dietary recalls, eating between a 12 and 16 hour period was 11,831 subjects. So we're comparing 414 people to 11,831, which is interesting when we look at the all cause mortality differential. And this is really quite fascinating. Okay, so that's important to just keep in mind. We're comparing a very small data set to a very large data set and making sweeping claims about the differences here. And my speculation is that we have an unhealthy user bias and we are trying to make the claim that compressing the feeding window is the reason why so many more people died in the eight hour feeding group compared to the 12 to 16 hour window. I think as you can see here, smoking status, 27% of the 414 subjects that reported that they eat all of their calories in an eight hour period were smokers compared to just 16% in the people who ate between a 12 and 16 hour window. So you have a significant difference here. Now it even gets more different between the 10 and 12 hour feeding window. It's also important to recognize 
that there are uh, gender differences here, smoking, and of course, body mass index differences as well. The group that reported eating in just an eight-hour window had the highest BMI of all the different categories. And you can see on the screen here, there's different categories, like less than eight hours, all foods were eaten. Between eight and 10 hours, all calories were eaten. 10 and 12 and, and 12 to 16 and beyond 16. So the heaviest, now we know BMI is a very crude weight for height relationship. It's not good at ascertaining body composition and body fat percentage, but you can start to see here that uh, smoking status, drinking status, uh, obesity and things are probably higher in the group that ate only in the eight hour period. Now, when we get to the all cause mortality statistics shortly, that's going to blow your mind. But first friends, I just want to say thank you for being here. If you're enjoying the content, hit that like button. I think these deep dives are very helpful to help us better understand what the media is saying versus what the actual evidence is saying. And we don't really have good evidence to show that fasting is harmful. So if you enjoy this message, hit that like button. Be sure to leave a comment in the comment section below and check out the Myoscience Electrolyte Sticks if you'd like to exercise. This is a great tool to augment your exercise sessions. They contain 2.6 grams of creatine per serving along with electrolytes that help the creatine get into your muscle cells to make your exercise sessions more enjoyable and improve your strength and performance. So I'll put links in the description below. Now let's get into all-cause mortality. Okay, incredibly fascinating stuff. All right, so if you look here, about 20% of the 400 subjects that reported that they ate all their calories in less than an eight hour period died over the study period. That is a pretty high number if you think about that. I don't know another study where 20% of people actually died in a cohort or a quartile or tertile. This is a high number. Uh, in contrast to uh, around 12, 10% in the other groups, because again, not that many people were intentionally practicing time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting in 2003 or even 2010 for that matter. Again, this did not become a popular feeding modality until maybe 2015, 2016. And, and even at that, it was a small subset of the health conscious populace, not widely spread throughout America. Okay, so a very high percentage of the group that reported eating all their calories in less than an eight hour period actually died during this eight year follow up period. That was the median time in which subjects were followed up over the course of eight years. In contrast, for example, in the 12 to 16 hour group, 1400 people of the 11,000 died. So you can do the quick statistics here in the math in your head. I mean, this is like 10%. So the death rate was double. Now, are we serious when we think that the sole cause of the increased death rate in the group that reported eating their calories in less than an AOR period was from their feeding window? When I just showed you the statistics, and you can see here the baseline characteristics, higher body mass index and significantly more smoked in this group compared to the people who ate, you know, reported eating, again, as unscientific as this in, is two random dietary recalls over a, a year's time. I mean, most people can't remember what they ate yesterday, much less the window and time in which they ate their calories. So the fact that the media is making a mountain out of a mound hill over this is really disingenuous. And I think it's a little bit curious because the American Heart Association, as many of you know, they put their heart healthy sticker, they allow food companies that is, to put this on cereal, Subway sandwiches, fake butter that has soy oil, corn oil, and canola oil in it. There's a whole list of foods. White bread has the heart healthy logo on it. Beyond meat. I mean, these are highly processed, industrial manufactured, ultra processed foods. And I've shared with you over the past several years now, all of the data finding that the real harbinger of ill health, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, autoimmunity, depression, dementia, is from consumption of ultra processed foods. So this organization, the American Heart Association, that enables their logo to be placed on ultra processed foods is now saying and putting out press releases suggesting that time restricted feeding will increase your risk of death by 91%. But when you look at the granular details, you can tell this is an unhealthy population, a very small in fact, I think statistically, there's a lot of adjustments that would need to be made here to even account for the fact that 
you know, this group smoked at a much higher rate. It's a much smaller population. I don't know how this can be statistically significant. You know, there was only 400 subjects compared to, you know, 11,000, right? I mean, how are we even able to uh, make assertions uh, based upon comparing a very small subset to a large uh, group? I, I mean, I don't know. I, this, to me, I think most statisticians would make a lot of adjustments for this, comparing a very small subset to a very large database. But again, this is unfortunately now going to be indelibly inked on people's minds. They're going to read the headlines and say, oh, I saw on Yahoo News that fasting is dangerous. I'm not going to do intermittent fasting. I'm going to eat my heart healthy Cheerios for breakfast. I mean, this these are the things that are going to be inked in people's minds for a decade or more decades to come. D these headlines, because they're not going to know the granular details like this, that yes, the group in 2003 that ate all their calories in a finite period of time, less than eight hours, they smoked more, they weighed more, uh, and they were probably just having meals uh, haphazardly throughout the day, having an unhealthy diet and lifestyle. 20% of these people died over the eight-year eight year, follow-up period. Very high. There was double the death rate, and it's probably not because of fasting intentionally. This is because they were probably living unhealthy lives. We all have friends who are like, they skip meals all the time. They randomly eat stuff. They might get hungry at midnight and go to McDonald's. You know, this is the type of person that we're comparing to someone who is probably a little bit more regimented in when they eat and what they eat. So we're comparing, you know, relatively unhealthy people to more healthy people and trying to say that the fasting thing is a differentiating factor determining their higher odds of death. And I really just don't think that is good clinical science, you know, for trying to educate people about how to be healthy, uh, scaring them in out of compressing their feeding window a little bit. Uh, when we have multiple randomized control trials, going back to 2019, there was a really fascinating study. Uh, it was Ju June of 2019, finding that early time-restricted feeding enhanced all sorts of longevity biomarkers, including increasing in the autophagy, decreasing uh, pro-inflammatory signaling molecules. Simeon Panda has done a lot of research on, on chrononutrition and time-restricted eating. You know, even telling people not to restrict their energy, just eat within a, a eight-hour window, and it improves all aspects of health and well-being, digestion, uh, and much more. Uh, and again, that's my bias because we have this dossier now emerging, uh, not just with intermittent fasting, more specifically early time-restricted feeding, finding health benefits. So when you have a epidemiological study that was, you know, collecting data prior to the really popularization of time-restricted feeding saying it's this harmful and when we're comparing very small numbers of people that smoke more, that weigh more compared to a large data set that smokes less and is probably healthier, um, that to me I think is is problematic. And I just wanted to convey that to you so that you had a better idea so that you can understand you can actually look at the data yourself because when you look at these numbers, you say, wow, we're comparing 400 people to 11,000? That seems a little off, right? And then when you look at the death uh, rate and all-cause mortality, 85 of 414 people died? Like th this group probably was making a lifetime lifetime of uh, unhealthy decisions, which is why they succumbed to, to their decisions earlier than, than the other people. So that's what I wanted to convey in this message. Hopefully you found this additional, these additional details more helpful, uh, more granular. I think it's important that we understand this, my friends. What do you think about this? Again, I just think there's a little bit of a conflict of interest here because I'm sure the American Heart Association charges Kellogg's and these different companies that are putting their logo on cereal boxes. I would imagine there's an annual fee to actually put that on the box and they're probably making some money off that. So the conflicts of interest here, um, although the researchers... Uh, in this, they report the funding was from the National Key Research and Development Program in China. So it's really hard to ascertain whether or not big food had their hands in influencing how this data was collected or manipulated and, and the statistical analysis. I, I'm not insinuating nefarious intent here. I'm just saying we always need to look at conflicts of interest. And the fact that uh, this has picked up so much media attention over the last several days uh, leads me to think that we all should be looking under the hood at this study. And uh, if you're a statistician and you, and you do clinical research and I don't know, is there a way to account for the fact 
that only 400 subjects are, are being compared to 11,000 subjects? I mean, I, I'm sure there's a statistical way to ana- analyze this that that is that I don't understand because I'm not a statistician. But um, anyway, friends, I just wanted to share this with you. I think there are no problems with time-restricted feeding. We have enough 10, 12, 14-week studies to show that TRF and intermittent fasting reduce blood pressure, improve metabolic health, decrease waist circumference, reduce triglycerides, all of which are independent cardiovascular risk factors. So if you have benefited from fasting, I don't think this, I, I certainly do not think that this nutritional epidemiological analysis warrants you to stop changing your feeding fasting modalities. So thank you for tuning in all the way through. I hope you enjoyed this message and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road.